Well, welcome to the 11th edition of the Royal Ocean Racing Club Time Over Distance Series. And I'm delighted to say that this week's special guest is Harold Cudmore, talking about the Admiral's Cup. In the 1970s, Harold was one of the first racing sailors to travel the world, competing at international yachting events. For close to 30 years... Harold has been involved with nearly every edition of the Admiral's Cup. To this day, Harold is still racing in a huge variety of events, anything from maxis to 18-foot skiffs in Sydney Harbour. Harold's abilities as a yachtsman are only matched by his talent for storytelling. Harold joins us from his home in Cowes. Harold, welcome to the show. Hey, Louis, great, and... What a fun thing to do. Hello to all friends and those who have tuned in. It's been rather fun with Louis running back through old events and everything else. And uh, thanks to Louis for finding out records and nudging my memory, I must say. It's been quite a while ago. There's been too much happened since. It's been quite, quite a while. Louis? I, I, uh, Harold, it's been an amazing research for me as well to, to look at the amazing event of the Admiral's Cup and uh, without your without your help I would never have got to uh, the level of understanding that I've got now and uh, I must say it's been absolutely amazing well the first slide we have shows the number of wins um, for each individual country but I think Harold it's worth explaining to the people at home um, that the teams have to qualify to represent their countries at that time, there was an enormous interest in the Admiral's Cup. It peaked out at 19 teams, 57 boats, and there was probably in total 100 boats either built or prepared to campaign to get on teams to get to the Admiral's Cup. So it was, it was described, we always describe it as the de facto world championship of offshore racing at the time. It was very exciting. And when they came to Cowes, it was a Cowes, an Admiral's Cup summer. It generated enormous further interest in Cows Week and was an enormous fun. Really? Yes. And um, we've got a, a date next to Australia. They, they won the last Admiral's Cup in 2003. The best nation by a long chalk is Great Britain with nine wins. And I reckon in the 16 Admiral's Cups that the Great Britain team um, was uh, competing, the worst they came was third. So Great Britain, had, over the years, have dominated uh, the Admiral's Cup. Germany with four, USA with three, New Zealand just with one victory in 1987. Um, we've got the Italians with, with, with one, France with one, and Holland in uh, 1999. Um, now, it all started for you, Harold, in 1977. And that's, funnily enough, when the, when the Union Jack was painted on Venture Keys, it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee. Um, and this was your first ride, Big Apple, and um, there was a hell of a story before you even got into the competition, Harold, is that right? You could say that. The, the owner's party decided to cruise the boat down to the starting cars. In those days, the boats were still dual purpose. You could marginally cruise them, and they thought it would be rather fun to go to the Channel Islands. So I was a bit surprised to get a telephone call saying that um, we had a bit of a downer, the boat's on the bottom, so we flew out instantly to Guernsey and discovered they ran into a rock going into one of the marinas, and the boat was sitting on the bottom uh, a month or so before the Admiral's Cup. 
Oh my! So we word. got together with the Joyce brothers, who did beautiful aluminium work. There's some wonderful boats up the Itchen River, and uh, put put the boat on a ship, shipped it back to the yard. They got it back in perfect condition, and it won Cour d'Elegance during the Admiral's Cup. So it was a, a rather dramatic way. So much for a lack of practice. We had one quick race before the Admiral's Cup. And uh, and it was a, a, a baptism of fire for you there in uh, in your first Admiral's Cup, Harold. Nineteen teams, Great Britain won with Moonshine, Yeomen Twenty, and Marionette, and you had a fantastic battle between Big Apple and Marionette. Is that right, Harold? Very much so. Chris Dunning and his, his team for Marionette, a college based team, who have become great friends over the years, and ourselves. And there was a third boat called Mandrake, or Mandrake, Giorgio Carriero. And uh, the three boats had great fun, but particularly Marionette and Big Apple. We, we were like connected by elastic, <laughs> backwards and forwards. So we had great. And I remember one particular inshore race. We were first and second, coming up the Solon to the finish, all sails set. It was great. I mean, Ron Holland was over the moon on it. It was a great success for him as well. And, and Harold, I, I know you, you had been to Cowes before, you tasted what Cowes was like, but that was your first Admiral's Cup. Were you, did, were you, bitten? Were you bitten from that from the word go? Well, I think when we came in to Cowes originally on a, a 30-foot aluminium boat for the Fastener 70, 73, and then we had it off for the Fastener, no engine, just a couple of batteries for lights, and did, did the trip around, so that's rather fun. So then the owner, Hugh Coveney, built a boat called Golden Apple. And it was called Golden Apple because, I'll come to that story later, but the, the, um, he couldn't fit a, a bigger name on the transom. So then we had Big Apple and a whole series of boats based from that. And mm. finally coming into Golden Apple of the Sun. And uh, Golden Apple of the Sun was uh, your ride for the 1979 uh, Admiral's Cup. And as we all well know the 1979 Fastnet was what a tragic one in history and with the, with the greatest respect um, I, I, you know I ask you what was the experience like for you Harold? Well first of all may, may I finish off the story on the name? Of course. The, the, the next boat had a wider transom because we found that those boats were quicker so the opportunity to put a stanza of the poem he had taken the name from by W.B. Yeats. If you don't mind, I'll read the stanza. I, those um, sailor friends of mine can probably turn off, but anyway, I'm going to. I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among the long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. A, a beautiful, a beautiful poem uh, from Yeats, uh... Harold, and with, with really good meaning, actually, about um, finding love, losing love, and, and, and searching for it. So um, I think very apt with, uh, with that particular race. Over 300 boats in that fastnet race, and, uh, and a huge Admiral's Cup contingent in the 79 fastnet. And Ireland was leading the Admiral's Cup going into that fastnet race, Harold. Yes, we, we had a wonderful team, and our local... We had trials to get on the team, and at one stage we had was it four or five boats in one yacht club, our, our, in Royal Cork Yacht Club, and the rivalry was so intense. But by the time we turned up in, in cows for the racing, we had found we'd outpaced the world. We were the quickest there was, and partially because we were all sharing the same yacht club bar, so winning was, <laughs> became very important. At the same time, it was a great effort in Dublin and north of Ireland in, in Ulster. And so we had a very representative team of Irish sailing. And as we went into the Fastnet, we were leading. Now, there was a, a little uh, joke going around cows. The good news is the Irish team are leading the Admiral's Cup. The bad news is they've started to celebrate. But we were, in fact, very serious about winning it. And we were very optimistic. We were very excited by it. Um, as we headed down the channel in that race, um, Golden Apple, we headed out to the middle of the channel, which was not the normal route. But we looked at the numbers, looked at everything else, and I was very comfortable going out there. I had almost been sent to Coventry by the crew until out of the mist off the Lizard, we dipped the 50-footer. We were 43, 
and the 50 footer Blizzard won the best boats in, in the Admiral's Cup. We were up with her, rounding the corner. Then we headed out into the Irish Sea, and uh, or the, the St. George's Channel, really, and then into the approaches. And the condition began to change. It was an oily swell. The afternoon, as we headed into the, towards the fastness, was very murky. It was overcast. The barometer was dropping at about three millibars an hour. And we knew we were in for a hell of a beating. So, in fact, towards the early afternoon, late evening, uh, early evening, late afternoon, we had what we call the last supper, because we knew we weren't going to eat again for a long time. As we headed into nightfall, the um, we, we had hauled a bit west, so it gave us a, a line into the fastness from uh, the south rather than a direct course. We, we had our tri-radial spinnaker, and we kept it up till we broached a couple of times. We took it down, and we approached the fastener rock around midnight, I think, or eight minutes past midnight. And I remember we cut the corner, and I was a racing rounding, which in fact was pretty terrifying, because the light from the fastener was throwing up the, the waves and everything else. And I looked at the dials, it was 52 knots across the deck, as we rounded the fastener and headed back. No, yeah. Incredible, uh, Harold, you know, your your recollection of that. And and I know you had uh, Hugh Coveney, obviously, on board, the owner of the boat. You had Rodney Patterson and um, yourself, you, you know, you were a young, you were a young man with a big responsibility with the with the tactics. And um, but in those days, there was only um, there was only VHF radio. You weren't aware of what was going on, uh, you know, in the entire race, were you, Harold? No, we weren't. And, I mean, as, as we head away from the fastnet, the conditions freshened. It was already, it was already pretty fresh. And then the uh, the problem occurred for so many boats. Uh, an hour or two after around the fastnet, we were coming back. We knew we were leading Admiral's Cup. We were driving hard. We were young. We were gung-ho. And uh, about two hours, the weather clocked. So about... Um, 30 degrees, something like that. And then anyone who's been out in bad conditions knows that the waves initially are quite steep. They're quite short. And then after a while, the waves lengthen out. So at that stage where they were building up, because the wind was at this stage was approaching 60 knots, as the uh, conditions built up, the wind clocked around and then it built up a, a different wave train. And when those waves met, it created a wall. And the small boats could not survive that wall. They were just overwhelmed. We were getting a hell of a beating on our 43 footer, and we were we were just holding on for dear life. And as uh, Ron Holland described at one stage, he he wanted to talk to us on deck. You know, we, we were working a watch system still because we needed this to keep ourselves somewhat fresh. And he said you would open the hatch momentarily between waves because the waves were sweeping the boat. And I remember switching to the storm jib at one stage, and I went on the deck. I said to the guys, OK, this is not one to tell you to do it. I'll go and do it myself with you because I've been out in bad conditions and some of the young, uh, younger crew members had not been. So we, we sailed through the night. I didn't know what was going on. Our navigators, um, uh, Philip Bowen and the, the owner, Hugh Coveney, were listening to the VHF. But there wasn't much information coming through because this, most boats didn't carry VHF. And, and uh, we really didn't, weren't much aware of what was happening. So as the weather lightened the following morning, we weren't that far from the cities. Um, I called for a spinnaker up. The crew said, no way. I said, right, let's negotiate this. We'll have a boomed out jib they propose. We called for that. They're on deck and we lost our rudder. So that's one that got away, I'm afraid. Mm. And uh, another another uh, of your Irish team also, I believe, lost the rudder or, or, or had to retire. And the, and the, and the Admiral's Cup was gone, Harold. Yes, indeed. And in fact, we um, we were out there. Conditions were bad. Forecast was bad that night. It didn't come through again. And the at the end of operations for the day, the helicopters flew by and said, do we want to lift ashore? The owner said, yes, we do. So in fact, we went off in the helicopter, refueled in the cities close by, and flew into Cold Rose, the Navy. And um, we, we sort of read about it then as we got ashore. It was absolutely horrific. But from that tragedy and great research and investigation, 
by the Royal Ocean Racing Club with independent assistance, they drew up a new set of rules. And, and the background again, just, just to understand, for people who wouldn't understand perhaps, there was a clear division between the race organizers then and the racers, the race organized by the racing and the racers were responsible for themselves and their boats. After that, the organizers said, right, we must take co-responsibility. So they set up a set of rules, regulations, recommendations, and that was the basis of uh, subsequent safety and those rules have been modified over the years. And I know that the, the tragedy 98 in the Sydney Hobart race was much ameliorated by the lessons learned in that fastest that minimized the loss of life in that race. So in a strange way, some good came out of it. Well, th th thank you, thank you, Harold. Uh, always a, uh, always a, a, a passionate subject, the, the, the 1979 Fastnet and Admiral's Cup, uh, which was won by Australia. You, can I tell you further then? Mm. Subsequently, uh, I was approached by the Royal Ocean Racing Club. Would I source some rock from the Fastnet for Memorial? So I said, how much? They said five tons. I came back and said, there's a helicopter operational in the area. W would half a ton do? Now, unfortunately, the rock and the fast is quite slaty, so it couldn't be molded, but we arranged for it to do to be dropped in by um, Crookhaven and I arranged for it to be delivered to the Isle of Wight. And in Trinity Church, just across the road from where I live, there's a memorial to the fastness and to the people who lost their lives that evening. There were 15 in the race, four others were shadowing the race, and I believe one or two others were at sea that night. And on various anniversaries, we, we have a commemoration service for the, those that are lost. So it's still an emotional time. That's, that's wonderful, and the rock that that memorial is made from is from the Fastnet Rock. Yes, and they have photographs from where it came from. Oh, wonderful. That's you on the right. Killian Bush on the left. Um, he, he, he needs no introduction to anybody from Ireland, but if I was to tell someone who doesn't know what Killian, who Killian Bush is, this man built every winning Volvo 70 in the Volvo Ocean Race. And that's just his recent work. Um, Harold, you go right back to very early days with Killian. Um, what do you have to say about Killian Bush? Yes, he, he built four winning around the world boats. Actually built three and consulted and worked partially on the fourth. And I knew his father, who was in Baltimore in West Cork. And he was a shipwright. It was a very small yard there. But he was sort of a genius in his own way. And he knew so much about boating, but was in isolation. There was no one that spoke to, to his level of knowledge. So in Yukon, they identified him and got him to help to build the various apple boats we had. There was a, a young kid working with him, an apprentice, his, his son, Killian, who was soaking in all this knowledge. Hugh identified him as having great potential, took him on Golden Apple. And then I took him on uh, as my first boat captain. And he built all my half tonners through the winter, and then he'd come and race them for the summer. I came match racing as well. So not long was a great boat builder. He was a great sailor and a great match racer. Very talented guy. Mm. And and his father George was one of the uh, the early builders into cold molding, um, which was laminating laminating wood and and carbon fibre construction followed that. Is, is, is that where Killian got those grounds to build those amazing boats? Well, what Killian understood was he understood boat building. And so when he switched to the new medium of carbon fiber, it was a case of learning technically. But he understood the loads of boating. And I remember in Sydney Hobart, there was a design very similar to the one he had built. Uh, I think it was when the passage broke in the, in the Hobart race. I remember phoning Killian and said, hey, I, I heard about this. What about your boat? And he said, oh, no, I, I saw the design fold, I repaired it, I, I, I corrected it. So the designers knew, and they, they entrusted their designs to Killian, that there would be someone there to look after him, even though he was very youthful. His first maxi built at the age of 24, great story, great story. Now, come on, Harold, you told me when we had a chat earlier that you had a particular mark rounding that this bowman used to perfect when you were match racing, and I know... You might not be able to tell us exactly what you called it, but just 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 tell us about this little uh, game you used to play match racing. At the end, of the boys were approaching a mark with marginal overlap. I said, "Is that something rounding?" And the boys would sort of shrink, you see, 
So we go into the mark, pushing the other guy with an, with an impossibility of tidying up before we got around. We go around the mark, spinnakers flying, everything up there. And I knew I could rely on Killian to get it done quicker than the other guy. We put our nose ahead and win the match. So great to have crews. And as time went on, I had some wonderful crews. As, we, as I got on the match race circuit, Killian dropped out of his boat building. And I had a great match race crew eventually. In the early days of match racing, as I just went around, I, I couldn't afford a Christ to pick them up as I went. So I met some wonderful sailors around the world, from California to New Zealand, Australia, France, and so on. It was mm. a wonderful time. Which leads us in beautifully to the 1981 Admirals Cup, where you were on hitchhiker, an Australian boat. Now, how does an, an Irishman get on to an Australian t Admirals Cup team, Harold? Well, I, I, I had become a journeyman sailor, wandering around the world. Match racing was my particular interest, which was the need to America's Cup. But along the way, I had to survive. So we weren't being paid in those days. So you'd say to some guy, listen, pick up an airfare. So if I was doing the Australian match racing series, I'd, I'd, I'd do an Australian regatta. They'd pick up the airfare so I could, I, could, I could get there. So I did the 79 Admirals Cup trials in Port Phillip Bay. Uh, with Impetuous and then helped them get on the team. And then subsequently I was invited on Hitchhiker 81, just as a John Bond. But that was the year, that was the, that was the scandal year in a sense, because, shall we say, the competitiveness of the Admiral's Cup was leading to some misbehavior and the organizers were not controlling it. So this was brought to the fore at the Southern Ocean Racing Circuit in Florida the following February when the American authorities, fortunately, decided to measure the boats. And I'm afraid many of our famous sailors were found to be racing uh, boats that did not measure. And by the time they'd sorted it all out, I discovered our boat, which was a wonderful boat, but we didn't have a good result. We finished second in the circuit. Um, and just shows that after that, then they started to tighten up. But in many ways, the damage was done. That was not good. Mm. But another big year, 81, 16 teams, and it was won by Great Britain, uh, the, the team of Victory, Dragon and Yeoman, um, but it was uh, a win for Britain, but they had to wait a little while for the next one, which you were very much involved with, but we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, thank you, Janet Grosvenor, for this fantastic <laughs> shot of what we think is a horse box that was the Rourke office during some of the Admiral's Cup with Janet is there with the long dark hair and the checkered shirt and with her friend. And Janet told me to show you this picture, Harold, and just say racer chasers. Yes, uh, of course, when you get 57 boats, the average 10 crew, uh, give or take 600, six, you know, 500, mostly fit young men arrive in town whatever town it is, and there were all the other boats for Cowes Week anyway, there was a, a wonderful social scene going on. So one of the things, of course, having perhaps in Big Apple, because of the graphics, one of the glamour boats, we did learn the advantage of that. We didn't rush up town. We just sat in the boat and waited for the girls to find us. Now, we were all young. We were having a wonderful time, and because it, it was on the overlap before professional sailing, but there was very intense sailing, a lot of the sort of semi-professionals were people working in the industry, sailmakers, boat builders, and that sort of thing. So uh, it, it was a, an enormous amount of fun, parties going on. And the Admiral's Cup lasted three weeks. Many of the boats arrived weeks earlier. So, so of course, we, we were having a great social life. And yes, Janet, you were part of that social life. And I have a good memory. And I'm sure you thoroughly enjoyed it like we did too. But, but Janet told me, you know, you, you know in those days international travel that was just for the the rich and famous to set, to have all these young men from all over the world come into cows it was a really big scene wasn't it wasn't it uh how absolutely we guys we weren't safe we just weren't <laughs> safe from <laughs> the predators and cows <laughs> <laughs> i think moving back to the moving back to the yacht racing justine four 19 uh, 83 Admirals Cup, Frank Woods, Justine Four, uh, best offshore Admirals Cupper at the Regatta Herald. Yes, this was Tony Castro's uh, 
one of his early designs. And uh, it was a wonderful boat. We had a, we had a great regatta. Uh, we had a, a faulty admiral, a uh, navigational error in the uh, in the fastest, but otherwise it was, a, it was a great boat, great program. And and um, Tony Castro went on to bigger and better things, as Ron Holland did before him. And and in that um, in that eighty three Admirals Cup, um, I seem to recall that you had a cracking battle with a French boat called Diva. In the fastnet race, is that right, Harold? Yes, indeed. And what you're about to raise, I shall mention. Yes, we did protest them for not having the nav lights on, because I've always been pretty hardball about rules and racing and everything else. But I like to stay within the tram lines, and we were so close when they switched off the lights, we lost track of her, and she got around us. So I felt pretty annoyed about that. Okay. So there we go. That was not popular. Now, many years later, like two years ago. I was sitting in a bar in uh, a restaurant in La Rochelle, and we were meeting some French friends who brought along somebody else and said, you might remember, <laughs> he is the designer of Diva who was on the race for the past. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. Okay. laughs> so, <laughs> he, he was pretty cool about it. Yeah. I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the 1983 Admiral's Cup was won by Germany again with a team of Sabina, Pinter and Outsider, 15 teams. But I'm just going to mention something here and it's not actually Admiral's Cup, it's One Ton Cup and Justine 3. And there's been some recent uh, news about uh, other boats, but Justine 3, Harold... When you yep. won the One Ton Cup, you won every race, and that had never been done before and has never been done since. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, we had a very good regatta. It was in, in Cork, at the Royal Cork Club, my home club, and we had a, a very strong crew that, that uh, I mean, included Joe English, Killian, um, uh, Joe Richards. It was, it was a great crew. And... and um, we pull away with very tight racing. Funny enough, against Graham Walker on Indulgence, who was also a very good crew, and John Rowan. And um, it was just a magic regatta, absolutely magic regatta. Mm. I noticed that in the bottom of the screen we're having little well, hellos from various people. Well, we, we have. We have one, actually. I, I, I think I'll, Rosalie von Bookwald Maurer, I hope I've got that correct. Uh, hi, Harold. Do you remember a Swiss boat named Assiduous? In the 1979 do Cup. Do indeed, absolutely. Hi, Rosalie. Thanks for watching. <laughs> was she well sailed, Harold? Assiduous was... Um, I think it, 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 it was a Peterson boat, I think. I can't remember the results. Okay. But I, um, it was a good boat. Okay, okay, wonderful. Um, so, yes, 1983, Justine for... Uh, one by Germany, and um, as I say, with Frank Woods. Let's move on. 1985, Harold. Now, what a story this is. Um, now, that boat is Graham Walker's Phoenix, but it should have been indulgent, shouldn't it, Harold? Please explain. Yeah, we were racing indulgence in the trials, doing pretty well, pretty confident we make the team. Graham had some business. The first time he did not sail on the boat, we were doing... A race that took us around the back of the Isle of Wight. We tacked into the shore. We heard a gentle grounding, we thought. And in those days, you know, we, we took grounding as part of the game. We sailed off. Somebody said, should we check it below? I said, oh, no, it was, just a, it was just, a, just a scratch, just touch of the keel, we thought. And then the boat's sluggish, so uh, somebody dived down below and had a look and said, hang on a moment, we're taking water pretty quick. So we tacked over to head towards the shore. But in fact, what we'd done is we'd sliced the hull on an edge of a wreck and uh, the boat went down. So just, there we are, lost it, gone, bottom of the ocean. So I'm afraid that's a phone call I would never wish to make again. And thank you, Graham, for being so tolerant. I had to phone up and say, Graham, I'm sorry, we have some bad news. I said, what happened? Did you lose a ring? No, we lost the boat. And further bad news, the keys of the aeroplane are on board, so you can't fly over and join us. And I, he was very cool about it. He took it like a gentleman. We were bruised for a while. I remember Peter Bruce on the selection committee came to me and said, look, you can't walk away from this. You've got a good team. There's a book called Rubber Duck. 
um, take it over. So I'm sorry to the crew of Rubber Duck. We had to flip you, jump aboard. The next race, the Admiral's Cup, was two weeks after the sinking. We went out, there were two initial races, and we won both races on the renamed Phoenix. Then we went on, there were three one runners that year, very strong crews. We went on to the Admiral's Cup, and we were top boat and in a very dramatic fashion. As we approached the finish, there was a German boat that was in with a chance to beat us. I think we were we had 15 minutes to the wrong side of us at the cities, and we just hung out in the driving rain, just no rest for anybody, just hung out, crossed the line, and, and watched us out to see her. She had to finish 15 minutes behind us, it was like 11 minutes behind us at the, at the cities. And she didn't finish, we, we couldn't work out what happened. And they were so fatigued, they sailed into the lighthouse at the end of the mole in Plymouth in the driving rain. Um, and just to give you an idea, we were trying hard. We weren't as sophisticated or skilled as today's sailors, but we were trying hard. I remember coming ashore in the driving rain. We hadn't won the Admiral's Cup, but we got tugboat, and I was just thinking, is this worth it? It was so bad. <laughs> Well, a, a little side story from that. I spoke to Eddie Warden Owen yesterday, and he was uh, brought into that team. He was the J24 British champion at the time. First off, why why did you get Eddie Warden Owen on board uh, uh, for the team, Harold? I took a view early on that the best way to win was get the strongest possible crew, but in the more um, hierarchical era. Holy, the man on the helm was, was, was the boss. Well, I took a view that if I could get an equal to myself, someone who was equally skilled, could be raised against me as, as anything else, and I said to him, why don't you come sail with me? I'll give you the helm. But I remain a skipper and tactician. And sometimes perhaps I do starts because I was quite good at that. And then I could attract someone to sail with me. So then we had, if you like, two top people on the boat, and we, we found that we tended to win. Then other teams followed us, and then they began to get better and better crews on the boats with way less ego attached to the helm so that we divided the roles more. Nowadays, they have not our own helmsman, tactician, navigator, but they have strategists as well. And usually, for instance, the, the back of the bus, the trimmers, they have to know so much about the boat, particularly match racing, so they know what to do without being told. So the game has leveled much more. The skill set has spread through the boat. Uh, but in those days, it was less so. And, and that's the background. And Eddie, of course, at the time, was probably one of the top sailors in the country and still is. And it was a fantastic addition to the team. And we had so much fun together, too, over the years. Hi, Eddie. I'm sure you're watching. I haven't said anything bad, have I? <laughs> well... I can say that in the heat of the moment, um, Eddie Warden Owen did recount to me that you did once say to him during that Admiral's Cup, if you can't do it, I know someone who can, Harold. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of being impolite to a much nicer guy. I do remember another story during the one time Cup, though, which I'm now going to tell. So Eddie was sitting on the back of the island, absolute limit conditions. And uh, we were all in uh, these sort of dry suits. So I needed to have a pee. So I went to the back rail and I was stripping off. And I said, Eddie, whatever you do, don't broach now. <laughs> he chuckled and wiped the boat out. And we wiped us out of one ton cup. <laughs> so but, there you are, yeah. Eddie. That's the story. But an, an amazing story with, with Phoenix. You know, two weeks before the Admiral's Cup to get into that boat. 18 teams in the cup. And you were top British boat. The British team was second uh, overall again to Germany, who were obviously very strong at that time. And uh, you, you mentioned about your relationship there with Eddie and bringing him on and uh, something quite nouveau to, to hand over the helm as a skipper. Relationships with owners are very important. There's yourself with uh, Graham Walker. Yes, it, it's, it's very important and... When you're organizing a boat, you first of all got to realize you're organizing it for the owner's dream. We have our dreams, of course, as the sailors. So the dreams are the same because he wants to win, we want to win. But you've got to have an empathy uh, for how he wants to do it because it's his program. Now, Graham 
is a very good organizer and he put together the crew. We had some great people on the boat, from Peter Morton to Dave Arnold, and I won't list the full crew, but he put together the group and he would sort of gently corral us to make sure we did the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've sailed many boats with him and he was principal backer of Crusader for the America's Cup 86-87 in Fremantle in Australia. So to this day we remain friends and we talk and meet regularly. Mm. Hi Graham, if you're watching. And you're there in your 1987 kit, so after sinking his boat in 85, uh, he obviously still um, wanted you to come and, uh, and be the man for his team. And uh, the 87 Admiral's Cup, um, there is actually indulgence racing there, and you, you had a tremendous battle in the 1987 Admiral's Cup, um, especially with New Zealand, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> my, my, my memory started to get a bit faint at this stage because I got so involved in America's Cup and match racing and doing other things. I, I wasn't so focused. This really was run by Morty. Peter Morton, as you know, has won one ton cup and has won all the ton cups, actually, subsequently. And Eddie and the others, they'd really taken over the program. I was joining it at that stage. Mm. Well, you had, you had Eddie with indulgence. Uh, Laurie Smith, I believe, was with uh, Jamarella, and you also had Mike Peacock's uh, Castro Juno. Yep. So uh, a, a cracking, a cracking team, but um, you came second to a very good team from New Zealand then, um, which had Brad Butterworth. But we've got the first of our rogue galleries. And uh, I use that term because that's one Janet. Janet Grosvenor told me that she had mug shots of all the sailors up in the office because they were all pretending to be different people. I think particularly Eddie Ward Nowen and Lou Varney, who both had big moustaches, and they used to pretend to be each other. So Janet used the term rogues gallery. So um, no, I'm not back for Janet. Are you sure they're in the office, not at home? <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a bit of fun here. We've got uh, this is uh, taken by Eddie Ward Nowen. I'll tell you who the photographer was. Um, it's the 1989 Admirals Cup team from Indulgence. And uh, let's see if the viewers at home can uh, pick out anybody in that picture. Any any advance on the viewers at home? Can you spot anybody there? I think I think Barry Dunning's actually watching. Yes, he's come through and. <laughs> Edward Cesar. <laughs> yes, Edward is there, yeah. He's uh, enjoying the commentary. Of we'll... course, on the left you have that famous diplomat, David Howlett. Dave, Dave Howlett, um, who um, is synonymous with Ben Ainsley as his coach, but Dave, David was a, a, a phenomenal sailor in those days, wasn't he? Yes, he won, he won a thin gold cup and he was a very skilled technically particularly. Yeah, and I believe James Rock has got one. Who have you got, James? Uh, well, no, I think we, you'll have to wait on that one, James. Wrong picture. Um, I'll give you another one. Oh, here we go. Adam Cowley, no, he's gone for Juno. It was a Humphreys one-tonner, not the Castro two-tonner, which is 89. So Adam Cowley's already caught me out. Thank you, Adam. I owe you a... Oh, you were pineapple and soda. I don't think you drink anymore, Adam, or never did. Um, Stuart Childerly is next to um, Sid, I believe, Harold. A very yes. young Stuart Childerly. Very, very, very talented sailor. He and his generation were a bit unlucky. The Admiral's Cup was sort of declining, and he didn't quite get the opportunities we had a little earlier. There were less owners involved, less programmes involved, but very, very talented sailor. And he's now one of our most talented race officers. Indeed, indeed. And I do, don't know the gentleman next to Stuart Childley, but the gentleman with both his thumbs up is Peter Morton, I am told. Yes, young and pretty, huh? And, you know, Peter, Peter has been around, you know, he's done so much in, in the last couple of decades, but I, I had no idea he was on that team. Um, I, oh, yes, he was, he was very much supportive of, of Graham Walker's programmes. And he himself, very quietly in the background, has provided enormous help to um, young sailors to get forward professionally. 
and he's been a bedrock of support for some of the best sailors that are currently out there, UK sailors. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Barry's come up with one. Derek Clark, is that the one in the middle, Barry? I think it is, isn't it? Thank you, Barry. Thanks for, uh, thanks for popping uh, in. There's Bob Wiley there. Yes, we've got Bob Wiley. He's um, uh, towards the bottom of the screen, bottom right. Um, Ian Finlay, who have you spotted? Geo is on Jamarelli. You're right, fin Finders. They're in Rose Gallery too. I'll tell you that for nothing. Um, we've also got in there um, Kelvin Rawlings, who is second from the left, and he did a two-handed fastnet campaign with Stuart Childerley a couple of years ago, Harold, and won the two-handed class. And really was wonderful to say, pissed our, the French competitors off enormously. <laughs> <laughs> they thought they owned the, the two-handed game, single-handed game, and these guys came out of the woodwork, and Kelvin's not exactly a spring chick, and they did a fantastic job, fantastic yeah. job. <laughs> I believe they're going again, Right. believe it or not. Yeah, oh, yeah. right, okay. I, I heard they, they were thinking about it. Well, I think that's enough of the Rogues Gallery for now. We've got most of them. Now, here we have Jamarella in the 1989 Admirals Cup. And uh, you were the manager of this team, Harold. I know you did do the Fastnet race, but your primary role was manager. Was that a different role for you? Yes, very, uh, yes quite different. You know, it's one of the problems, with, one of the reasons I went into the manager role is that we had a succession of seconds in previous Admirals Cup. And the reason is that there was no team atmosphere. The, the, the boats were racing individually, and instead of racing as a team and get the result, they were racing to try and beat the other members of the team. So you have a situation when you have 57 boats, if there's one boat a first and one boat a fifth, what's really critical is the boat that's lying 35th or 40th is to pull up five or six places. So what they would tend to do is shoot a corner and try and get up to first. And we just could not get across the line with that team attitude. So that cost us two cups, in my opinion, okay. alone. Um, the last inshore race, the Admiral's Cup. So, you yeah, know, it's easy to complain. I said, right, I will go into the management role and see, can I fix that particular uh, situation? And I, li I like to think I didn't have a big contribution because they were on the boats. I did the fast on Jamarella. Uh, I fill in because Laurie Smith couldn't do it. Uh, but I tried to create the atmosphere where we raced for, on the numbers. And I remember choking, going down to one of the boats had a bad race one day and really giving them a full on, on deck. I said, excuse me to the owner. And I gave the crew a complete bollocking. And I said, your, your heads are down. The team has done well. What matters is that you support the team. It's the last boat wins the cup, not the first one. So it's the performance of the weakest boat is the one that wins the cup. Anyway, we got there eventually. We got there. You, you certainly did. Jamarella, Juno, Indulgence, the, the winning British team in 1989. First cup win for eight years. And all of the boats were consistent. But Jamarella, 42 boat fleet, no worse than fourth in any race. That's an incredible performance. Yes, Alan Gray, again, as an owner, was, was very organised. Put together a great programme. I had a great crew around with Laurie and the others, and they, they, they did a really perfect program. Yes, and I believe that the, it, it was a far 50, but it was built in Lymington, and a lot of the team actually built the boat. Is that correct, Harold? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. That's um, uh, Lou Varney told me that. Uh, then, then it's gospel. <laughs> Well, that, 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 that almost, almost with serene, silky skills brings us to our second rogues gallery, which is the victorious Jamarella team. And um, we'll, we'll give you one. There's Harold Cudmore at the back there. Your first Admiral's Cup win, Harold. What was that like? Yeah, that, it was very satisfying that the team won, for sure. But the way, the way that the win happened was what really pleased me because it was to create this team view. And I think uh, Juno was probably uh, the weakest boat that year because indulgence is always going to be good. <clears throat> and what they did was they held their team place. They, they, they made sure they supported the team. 
got good enough result to ensure the team under Mike McIntyre. And that, that in, in a way, is the way to do it. A boat that doesn't have the blinding speed and everything else that the leading boats have, but hung in there, got the numbers right, and got a team result. Very impressed with them. Right. And there's Lou Rani. You told the story afterwards about these very fulsome moustaches, people being mistaken. Well, you know. Come on. I, I don't often do this, but for this one, we've got to. Look at that. For, for one young lady, a, a moustache like that, give or take, you know. A guy with a similar moustache will do occasionally in 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 in, yes. in, in, in half life. Okay, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> and up top left there, that's Guy Barron. He doesn't even look like he needs to shave. He's that young. Yeah, he still looks youthful. <laughs> great barman, great barman. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the the rogues gallery there. I'll 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 break rank because uh, our viewers at home are keeping quiet. They don't want to upset anyone, but. George Skudos is in there. We had somebody saying um, they saw George in the last photo, but George Skudos there has got his elbow up. He's leaning on the boom. Uh, Jabber is just to the right of him. Uh, Mark Chisnell. Uh, you have Alan Gray and uh, Lou Varney with the cup. Great uh, story about George Skudos. We met him for the first time in Scotland when he sailed with us on a different programme. And I remember saying, this, this guy is the sort of guy... <clears throat> He's big, strong, and very smart. So I took him aside and said, he's a teenager, look, we'd love to see more of you in racing, but please, <laughs> would you learn to speak English? We couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't understand a word, he said. Now to meet him, he's a city, a city sophisticate. <laughs> right. It is his thick Scottish accent. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And I'm led to believe the gentleman on the left is Jim Close. Who went on to 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 race several round the world races and uh, have a big career in sailing? Uh, Jim Close there on the left. Um, there's a couple we're not so sure of, but um, a very happy crew and well done for uh, winning the Admiral's Cup. Um, let's go on now. This is an amazing picture, and I have to say a big thank you to Rick Tomlinson. And also Beacon of Cows as well, who've, who've given us some wonderful pictures. But this is a beautiful shot of a lured mark rounding um, in the uh, 1993 Admiral's Cup. Um, and uh, you were with the Irish team, with all three boats called Jameson Harold, is that right? That's correct, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, John Story uh, sorry, was massively supportive. And we had, we had um, uh, a bit of a... Bit of a Use, excuse the pun, a bit of a backstory to that. I had met him, I'd been introduced to him, and we, we raced in the Sydney Hobart, and he had a, a 43 foot far designed boat, which, which had been owned by Peter Kurtz. But we won the Southern Cross Cup for an Irish team. We also won the Sydney to Hobart race. So he, he got very enthusiastic. We went on to Hawaii, and we uh, acquired a boat that had done the Maui race from um, Canada, and we raced that in a European team, and we won that series in Hawaii. And he thought it would be rather fun to put together a team. So he diluted it among different boats, and we ended up with, with three Jemison boats, one, two, and three, that had most, that had most cup. Ours was a bit of a sorry story, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. We were sailing past Gurnard Rock, and we bounced off the rock to the west of the ledge, and unfortunately the keel came off, so we had to beach the boat, and um, that is finished our Admiral's Cup hopes that year. And yes, trust Harold, me, yeah. trust me, rather embarrassing. <laughs> it, it, it was rather embarrassing, but I think there's a lot of um, the, the the story through the ages has got twisted and turned, and and you know I was led to believe that you basically went too far inshore and run aground, but that isn't the case, is it, Harold? What actually happened? We were outside the, out, we're heading outside the reef, the Garner Ledge, and there's a, there is an outlying rock to the west of it. And we clipped it, and um, that should, should not have been the end of the world, but the keel came off. So we beached the boat then, because, of course, without a keel, she floated. And, and um, uh, as I say, the, not alone was it high profile, because it was so obvious that the press was there, but as a side story, we 
had chartered the boat from King Harold of Norway, or Prince Harold, I think he was in those days. Mm -hmm. So that got quite a few puns and some pretty major headlines in the newspaper. And I remember going to the press conference that evening, and you know, when you're when you're up there, you've got to take it. I did bring my tactician navigator with me. I shan't mention them here. Okay. But as I looked back at the press conference, in those days, because of the camera qualities, you need a lot of bright lights to, 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 to make sure that the picture came up. So looking through the bright lights, I could see all this white, which I'd never seen before at a press conference. I was the, the press corps laughing, the teeth were showing. Right. <laughs> And I'll just pull this one back up. Stuart Greenfield, great ad campaign, though, for Jameson's. And it was, wasn't it? Yes, they did very well. Yeah, they, they, they were very happy with the, the publicity from that. Um, but... Um, By the way, Stuart Greenfield ended up racing one of my old half tonners very successfully a couple of years ago. Uh, Silver Shamrock, I believe it's now called. Correct, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, was one of, that, was a, that was one of your boats, Harold. Yes, it was. Mm. Ah, okay. Yeah, Stuart did a good two-handed campaign with that one. I, I remember mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, so um, we, we had a... Um, 1999, you also ma managed the British team, um, coming in third, uh, which was um, um, skippered by Stephen Bailey, and Peter Harrison was um, a, great, a great supporter of that campaign, wasn't he? Yes, I'm, um, at this stage, my, my memory is running out <laughs> about which, who did what. But I do remember, I think, again, there was a, I think, if, if I have it correctly, we, we had a, there wasn't a team, there wasn't a good team dynamic. I was unable to, to fix that. Okay. Um, but Peter Harrison stayed on 2003, the last Admiral's Cup, the last edition. Won by Australia, the Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club, Wild Oats, Bob Oatley's, and Aftershock, yeah. Colin O'Neill. And I see uh, the Admiral's Cup when I go down to, the, to Australia every winter. I see it there. So, yeah, Peter Harrison was a great supporter of Australia. Of course, went on to the America's Cup with Ian Walker as a skipper. And we're just looking at this clutch of sailors here that did that 2003 Admiral's Cup. Um, you know, just picking out a few, you've got Tim Powell, Jerry Mitchell, Peter Morton, Guy Barron, Boise, Kevin Rawlings, uh, Steve Hale, Simon Fry, Andy Hem. You know, all of these sailors had the advantage of racing in the Admiral's Cup and seeing it go on. Two decades of sailors haven't, Harold. Yep. Can, can it return? I've been thinking about that, and many people have been thinking about it and talking about it. And I think the only way to get it back is not to try and do exactly what we did at the latter end of the Admiral's Cup. But I think we have to go back to the basics. The greatest uh, event of the ROC calendar is the biannual faster race, 350 entries. Now, I think you could build an event linked to the fastener. So, if, for instance, you had as in the original Admiral's Cup, way back when they, they began, or somewhere along the way, you had the channel race, the faster race, and one inch race in cars, to quite a tight time scale. The sort of time scale where people say, well, channel race is a good practice race for the fastener. Could do a race in cars, we mm -hmm. could do that. But if you got support for it, it would also be very important to ensure that it was a social highlight. So those who did the Admiral's Cup would be catered for with great events, great parties, everything else. So people would say, rather than just turning up and doing the fast and disappearing, they would come to cars, have a great festival, and build up an extra, if you like, leg of the fastest, rather than a standalone Admiral's Cup that had become almost disassociated from the fastest in the latter period. That, I think, would be possible that way to re-establish it. Wonderful. F thank you. Well... Harold, that's all we have time for this week. Um, a, a last few words from you. Well, Louis, good fun. Thank you. It, it, it was good to go back over old times. And um, hi to all the people who looked in and checked in. And uh, we look forward to next week, which I understand you're going to tell us about. Yes, thank you, Harold. And, and thank you for your 
riveting stories of the Admiral's Cup. Um, and yes, this is a good opportunity to say who's going to be on the Rourke Time Over Distance series next week. And that will be John Holt from the Greg City Academy in North London, where inner city kids as young as 13 have felt the passion and the wonder of racing in the Rolex Fastnet race. We're going to play you out with a video from Discover Island. Thank you very much to them about those golden apples of the sun that Harold was uh, telling us about earlier on. Thank you very much for watching. wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread and when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out I dropped a berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair. who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun.